evening. I'm Georgia Laris, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Mesa College Art, uh, the Mesa College Art Department to our first exhibition and lecture. Uh, this evening, it's just wonderful to see everyone here. Joan Austin is here from San Diego State, and, and it's uh, so great to have uh, all of this expertise and energy and enthusiasm uh, as we open our first show. Um, this year, as you may know, Alessandra Moctezuma, our art gallery director, is um, delivering twins. And she is not here to, um, uh, to facilitate the program this semester. However, over the summer and up until very recently, she's been working very closely with a dynamic team. I'd like to introduce you to Cindy Zimmerman. <laughs> And also to Barbara Sexton. Um, they've been working to put the program together, um, and we're very excited to have uh, all of your professional expertise and the dynamic that you bring to the campus. Well, without further ado, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our two artists, Suda House and Cheryl Tall. As you can see, our art gallery is a wonderful laboratory where students can go into the exhibit many, many times um, during the uh, run of the, sh of the exhibition. And there has been tremendous response um, and a lot of discussion that I think you'll be hearing tonight from the individual students who are attending. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to view the exhibit, uh, please know that the exhibit will be up until October 2nd, and uh, will extend up in, through that date. Suda House is here, if I may recognize her here. <laughs> and I'm sure you uh, in, enjoyed the work. She's a photographer of national and international reputation who lives and work here in San Diego, California. She's a 1980 recipient of a National Endowment of the Arts Emerging Fellowship, and she is currently Professor of Art and Photography at Grossmont College. Thank you very much. We enjoy your being here. And Cheryl Tall, initially introduced to us through an exhibition that Brian Gillis facilitated for the campus with Ensica last year. We enjoyed your work. And uh, Suda is a nationally, excuse me, Cheryl Tall is a nationally recognized ceramic sculptor. She's been published in the Ceramic Design Book, Low Fire Surface Design, and the American Craft Magazine. Currently, she is living and working here in Solana Beach, California. A very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank uh, the wonderful Museum Studies Department here at Mesa College, Pat Vine, Barbara Sexton, uh, Alessandra. And uh, they've just treated me very nicely and I think have put together a wonderful exhibition. And uh, also to thank Suda for showing her work with mine and uh, my wonderful husband, Bruce. Uh, operating the slide projectors. <laughs> My slideshow tonight is a little bit different from what I've done in the past. Uh, maybe in the past, I've uh, concentrated more on presenting the work chronologically from earliest work to later work. Uh, this time, I decided to delve into some of my influences and also to present the work um, kind of like a story, a metaphysical journey. This piece represents birth or perhaps rebirth. Uh, on the right, it's called Chrysalis. It's about three foot high. And on the left is a mask from Mexico, the skull with the starburst around it. To me, this represents the ongoing rebirth of the self. We all grow and change in many different ways. And a sort of phoenix-like, we rise up and take on new challenges. Okay. 
We're moving from birth into childhood, into the playful aspect of my art. Uh, the piece on the left is called Commedia dell'arte, after the Italian uh, 17th century Puccinella and uh, all the characters from that era. You'll also see the famous drama faces, the happy and the sad. And in childhood, we go from one minute being exuberantly happy to uh, being in tears. And that's another mask uh, from Mexico that, to me, represented the, the lighthearted, uh, freeform approach of childhood. This is cake for breakfast on the left. Do you remember being six years old and being so excited that your birthday was coming? This is just to, to celebrate uh, the joy of friendship and birthdays. And uh, the, the candles are actually art pencils. And it, it celebrates the playful aspect of, of being an artist. The one on the right's a little more serious. Uh, it's uh, Nitekia Paz, French for don't worry. And uh, sometimes we have a fear maybe of getting older. And you can see it's uh, more candles as, as the person gets older. Now we're moving into the beautiful, youthful abundance of teenagehood. And uh, this is Lady Abundance, uh, full of promise, ready to take a bite of the world. And this is another Mexican mass called uh, Marangela, uh, which means Little Mary. Uh, the youth and fullness of the goddess. Uh, this is Phaedra on the left. And this is a cave painting from 20,000 years ago. And as I study, prehistoric art is uh, one of my influences. And as I study prehistoric art, I'm always amazed at how fresh and vibrant it looks. I can't even imagine anything 20,000 years ago. Another interesting uh, fact is that the colors used in these cave paintings, the ochres, the burnt siennas, uh, are still used in ceramics today. This piece is called Primavera. You can actually uh, see this piece now on exhibit uh, in Fallbrook. They're having a big ceramic show with uh, 14 different artists. And it's uh, five foot tall. And uh, primavera is, means uh, spring. And on the other side is uh, an earth goddess uh, from the age of Mithras. And it's thousands of years before the birth of Christ. And uh, it, too, is celebrating the birth of spring. Now we're moving into... The most interesting stage, one of the most interesting stages, uh, is courtship. And here we have uh, two happy couples, or maybe not so happy, but uh, the one on the left is called House Heads. And there are two people who are very close together. Uh, I do a lot of double images with the, the heads blending one into another and maybe coming from one base. And I use this to symbolize family relationships or uh, close relationships. And uh, the other one is called Thief of My Heart. Here we get to marriage. This is Dance of the Suburbs on the left. They're actually dancing the pavane, a medieval dance. And uh, that's Parallel Lives, which you'll see in the exhibition here at Mesa College. Different aspects of marriage. Uh, now we're into the fertility <laughs> rites. 
Uh, this is called Nest of the Questers. On the left, you see the, the bowl of eggs, which symbolize fertility. And uh, the questers are actually the birds on the top of the headpiece. Many of my pieces, uh, the grand finale is at the top. It's, it sort of uh, symbolizes what the piece is about to me. And in this piece, they're, they're little birds who are eternally flying away to search for knowledge. And then they come back. They come back to the nest. So they're always searching, but coming back home again. And this is an al alchemy figure. Uh, the two heads in this figure represent yang, yin, male, female, the balance of the whole. This piece is also in the exhibition. It's called Sight of the Angels. And it's from a quote uh, by Disraeli uh, when they were having the controversy about are we descended from the apes or not. And uh, Disraeli said, well, I would rather be on the side of the angels. He didn't really want to be descended from a monkey. But in, in this piece, uh, I'm using it as the protective goddess. If the monkeys are becoming extinct, then perhaps we're in danger of becoming extinct. You can't separate one from the other. And so this, this is the protective goddess. This is Europia. I read somewhere that uh, all of us came from one woman in Africa. They can trace the DNA back. And uh, so this is about people dividing and traveling and forming new civilizations. And then the, the two-faced mask is from Mexico. This is called American Dream. Now the couple are, are married and uh, are in a neighborhood, buying their first house perhaps. Uh, you'll see rocks are falling out of the house. Uh, it looks a little precarious, uh, and it's about the perils and joys of home ownership. On the right are, are medieval tiles from the ninth century. And I included those to show where I get my textures from, uh, my inspiration for textures and for colors. And again, if you go to Lana Wilson's class at Miracosta College, you'll see students using stamps in the same manner that these tiles were being made. So I feel like we're going backwards and forwards in time, pulling from history uh, and influences in our work. This piece was made recently uh, in Canada at Banff Center for the Arts. It's called Child's Play. One thing characteristic of my work is uh, the finger texture. And it's caused by using very soft clay and using uh, a squishing te technique with the fingers. And uh, this has been compared to roof tiles or petals or perhaps shingles. And uh, so this is a picture of a, a thousand year old roof on a church in Norway that is still being used. And I thought it was so beautiful and uh, echoes the, the roof textures in Child's Play. Well, I really love turrets and castles. <laughs> and someday just have to have a house with turrets. They, they don't seem to be making them very much anymore. Uh, but I just love that form. And, on the piece on the right, which is now in the collection of the Burroughs Chapin Museum in South Carolina. Uh, it's called Victorine Abbey. This piece was actually uh, made before the present body of work. I've been doing the coil pinch technique for maybe seven years. And for seven years before that, I just worked with uh, flat slabs and architectural forms, which I would later carve uh, with stories. The narrative is uh, an important part of it. This is called Necklace of Stones. 
and uh, it was made after a trip to Europe uh, when I would see these buildings that were thousands of years old and I just felt the weight of history and I wanted to show a piece that uh, showed that feeling. This is also a, a recent piece. It's called Pacific Towers. I've been in California two years and still get east and west mixed up because uh, in Florida, where I lived, the ocean was on the east. And so now people say, go west, and, you know, I'll go the wrong direction. One thing I like about medieval art is the very weird sense of perspective and scale. Uh, you'll see buildings uh, with people in them that uh, it would just be impossible. They're almost bigger than the building. And I like to uh, show that in, in my art, the, the persona of the building emerging from the skin of the building. Okay. This is City Dwellers. And uh, the illustration on the right is from the Kabbalah. And it's uh, the house as man. And both of these drawings are based upon the tree of life. And I wish I knew exactly what it said, but uh, it's a path. It's a path to enlightenment by going through all the different stages of the top to the bottom. Many of my figures are looking upward like they're stargazing or awestruck or maybe searching for something. Okay. Every now and then I just have to do a monster. I just have to. <laughs> and every life has its ebb and ebbs and flows and it's times of terror and joy. And this is called the debt monster. He's obviously inspired by my love of gargoyles. And he's sort of devouring uh, that pink house. And the, the people are falling out of the basket, thrashing about. Well, to combat the, the monsters, um, I invented the guardian figures. And I, I drew inspiration from the green man. You'll find the green man face all over Europe. It's a medieval imagery and maybe even older, maybe uh, from the Druids. It kind of symbolizes the regenerative character of nature. In the winter, you might think, oh, this is dead. And then in the spring, it comes back, and it's full of life again. And this is a theme that recurs throughout my work. And so the guardian figure on the right is uh, six foot tall and uh, is built in eight different sections. Actually, one of a pair. They're meant to go on either side of a door. Here's an, a different version of the green man. And uh, this was a, a figure from my MFA show on the right. It's called Yes or No. And it can be turned uh, either way. I love the, the big heads on, on Easter Island, the, the monumentalness of, of them and I've made a series of giant heads. This one stands three foot tall, and it's called Strange Chapeau. Another giant head. The head on the right is uh, the head of Mithras, the god, and it's 30 foot tall. And actually, those statues were much, much bigger. They lost their bodies in an earthquake, and only the heads are left. This head on the left is Handyman, and it's almost four foot tall.
These are stone carvings from a, a cave in China. Uh, in, they were created in 450 AD. And uh, this was a, a piece inspired by the, the whimsicalness and the, the flight of the angels. Uh, it's called Dreaming the World on the right. And it's, uh, it's loosely based on one of the incarnations of Vishnu. Supposedly, he had 10 forms that he could come to earth in. And one of them was called Dreaming the World. And I just thought, that was fascinating, you know? What if this really is all a dream? And uh, what if he wakes up? What happens? So that's Dreaming the World. I'm frequently asked, what is that expression on their faces? You know, what are they thinking of? And so I, I found some pictures uh, that showed a similar expression. Uh, on the left, this is from a play called Museum, and it's a satire of contemporary art. And uh, that's a wonderful piece of contemporary art that they're kind of looking askance at. And uh, the next one is from The Little Shop of Horrors. And has anybody seen that, that movie? Yes, yes, it's wonderful. And what is it that they're looking at? A giant plant. So in my figures, there's kind of a awestruck or, or searching or mystified uh, Sometimes I feel like a, a time traveler that I'm, I'm looking at today's world with 11th century eyes. And yeah, I can do computers, I can go in airplanes, but isn't it a little strange, you know, like what keeps that airplane up there? And how do people get these emails? You know, they just appear on your screen. So it's all uh, kind of wonderful, but strange. Another incarnation of Vishnu. He came to earth as a fish, a fish man, and warned mankind that there were, was going to be a great flood. And uh, that he said everybody should uh, take two of every animal and find a boat. And this is the same legend that's in the Old, Old Testament. And uh, I've been reading a book by Joseph Campbell and he's a philosopher who compares all these different myths. And it's, it's amazing that the Aztecs might have the same myth that maybe the medieval French person would have. Or the ancient Chinese would have a similar story that would go along with this world flood. So that's uh, Electra, um, sort of an electrified mermaid on the right. On the right is a 11th century stone carving from a cathedral in France. And we even know the name of the sculptor. It's Gizel, Gizel Bertus. And uh, I just love the flowing lines of this piece so much that I put it in the, the piece on the left called Mermaid's Tail. I seem to do a lot of mermaids and, and fish. I don't know if it's because I'm a Pisces or because I've always born near the ocean. I've always lived near the ocean. Uh, this is called Oceana. And it was made after a, a time in Florida where the waterways became polluted and the, the fish were turning belly up. And uh, so she's holding uh, a human fish in feeling kind of a great sorrow and compassion for this fish. This is another view of Oceana at an exhibition. And the piece in the background is called Endless Conversation. Another mermaid uh, from a capital in a cathedral in France. And the piece from the exhibition, Tallulah. And uh, she's named for a, a 
Gaelic, goddess of the waves. Helena's horse on the right. And the one on the left is a series of giant, giant carvings in China that they, they carved right into the cliff. And they're quite wonderful. And uh, I especially like the way the figures seem to be coming out of the head. I like the idea that things can be more than one thing at once. What you see isn't always what you get. There's many different levels are happening at the same time. And so uh, on my figure, the horse is representing her dream of having a horse or perhaps of being a horse person. There's Kiwi Woman from the exhibition and uh, more of these uh, cave carvings from China. I especially like the way the striated uh, the styrated la layers of rock are showing and the sections because uh, if you'll notice my pieces are all built in sections and I incorporate that as part of the design. This, uh, this carving from a cliff is in Sri Lanka and I think it's quite wonderful. And uh, this piece on, on the left is called Pulling Man and you can't see the back, but there's another person on the back, and they're tilted slightly like they were bending together. Well, we're getting to uh, the end of our story. Uh, the, the passage that we've just gone through, uh, to me, represents seeking of spirituality and uh, searching for answers, and uh, this, this skull is Neanderthal skull, and it's 50,000 years old. And you can see in my piece, which represents, um, it's called Kiln Goddess. It represents a woman who's worked in clay like they have for many, many centuries. She has almost a similar bone structure and it just amazes me that there could be this history that just goes on for centuries and centuries. But this isn't really the end because everything just grows and changes. And so what looks like death comes alive again, like the green man and, and like the, the first figure, Chrysalis. It's an ongoing process of, of change and growth and rebirth. That's a Mexican mask on the left. And the piece on the right is called Heads Above Water. You can see the tentacles of growth spurting up. This, this is the last picture. Uh, that's me with a, a Chinese New Year mask. And this piece is called Festina Tarde, it's uh, old Italian for make haste slowly. And that's the end. Wow, it's dark out there. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having me to Mesa, Art Gallery, Mesa College Art Gallery, and I want to thank everyone that... Uh, made the exhibition possible and, and the great opportunity to meet Cheryl and, of course, to welcome her to our community. Um, I'm a transplant here to San Diego as well. I moved here from Los Angeles in 1980. I was hired at Grossmont College, which was so gracious this evening to let me bring my class, who they've all wanted me to call Roll tonight. But I, I told them I didn't think I'd do that. But it's great to have them here and my friends. And, and my neighbor, Joan Austin, is here today who has a wonderful garden. And I would like to dedicate the 
the plant forms that you see in my uh, talk tonight to Joan, who is a mistress and mistress of the garden, and she grows wonderful things that she shares with me, and we, we've collaborated often, haven't we, Joan, throughout life, so it's great to have her and her son Jonathan with us this evening. Um, many people are familiar with my work from the 1980s. I moved from Los Angeles. I had done work about images of women in media. Um, I was inspired by uh, the feminist movement, um, braced some of it, rebelled against others. Very curious as a mid-20-year-old about how Im women were portrayed, and I did a lot of images of uh, female bodies on fabric, sewn and stuffed with threads, and I used a color copier, which was very innovative in the late 1970s. 3M Color and Color invented one, and then Xerox invented one, and now I have one in my basement, which shows you how fast technology becomes accessible to everyone. And I was trained as a color and color consultant, and I worked my way through graduate school. And um, I got hired in 1980 uh, out of Los Angeles to come down here and teach. And I didn't know how I would make the transition. And when I came to San Diego, uh, I immediately realized I need to find something to do outdoors because this was the city that never stopped vacationing. And everyone was um, out in the sun. And so I started swimming, which I had done as a child growing up in the south and then living in Texas and then finally Southern California. And um, so I made a series of images that many of you are familiar with from the water called the Aqueous Smith series. And they're images created in a studio in a tank of water. And the figures um, are posed by me, and I add elements, and I light them. And I had complete control. And it was very Hollywood, and I made an image every month, and I had people making waves on the side. And, and unfortunately, uh, with 30 minutes, I didn't have a chance to bring you those images. But I guess you could go to suitahouse.com, which is a little plug for my website and you could look at them. But um, basically, um, it was all about being influenced by San Diego and the water. And I called them myths because I felt that the women represented more of what was going on in the 80s with three or four shoulder pads and charging the um, glass ceiling. And my women were very powerful. They had weapons. They were struggling in the water. And they mirrored very much my own life of adjusting to um, being in a new location and uh, making my career and my home here away from family and friends. Um, I also went to the observation window of the swimming pool at our local community college, meaning Grossmont, and I photographed through the window people floating and suspended, and I called that the Aquiella series. And I worked on all of that up until the end of 1980. And then I um, met someone who was very special, and I married him. And we then embarked on an exploration and a journey of starting a family. And four years later, in 1992, I had a little girl named Emma, and I became a mom. So I kind of did media images of women, myth, metaphor, and then motherhood. So this is where we're going to start. This is exactly 12 years ago. Um, the first image that I want to show you... Um, I had gone to the uh, grocery store, and I had purchased one of these plants. I don't know what it's called. It's called, I, I call it the, the green wound plant is the working title. It doesn't really have a uh, mythological title. And I bought this plant, and I put it in uh, my basement, and I have windows that, that look out to the sun. And I left it there for three or four days as I was tending to my daughter. And I came back, and the plant had completely grown this long stem towards the sun. And those of you who have a very busy lives, um, this was magical to me, that this was going on, that this was happening, that this form, this plant, had this desire to continue to, to grow and to evolve. So I started to look around at the simple things in my life. I had taken a Greek mythology class at Grossmont, and... One of the sayings from the classical mind um, instruction that I received was, get close to what you know. Well, here I am, um, uh, mothering and uh, going grocery shopping and doing things that were just so unlike my single life and so unlike my career 
And then this plant, which was on automatic pilot, was trying very hard to evolve and to continue to grow. I sort of examined items from the garden. This is a, a rose, uh, a thorny rose plant with no flowers on it. And I began to kind of explore the, the science and the technology of fertility and began to make images about that. And I'd make all these images at night down in my basement darkroom while my daughter and my husband slept. And uh, it was, if you walk by my house, you'd see flashes going off in the basement. I always thought there would be policemen showing up thinking I had, you know, I was making drugs or something down there. <laughs> but um, to continue to make my art through early infancy of my daughter, I would do these little setups. And so this sort of became my reality. And I'd received, um, often I would receive florist bouquets. And it amazed me that um, someone would wire a flower so that it wouldn't wilt. And um, that, if, excuse my terminology, man, uh, humanity, a person, would thread this wire around this plant and make it so it wouldn't wilt. And this idea of placing, you know, man interfering with, with birth, man interfering with cellular manifestation, all this became very intriguing to me. And so I got, I got quite interested in it. And these are just three of about a dozen of these small little still lifes that I did late at night while everyone slept. I also have a whole series of my daughter's toys uh, photographed at night. They used to, uh, I would sit in the nursery with her, and they would stare at me. And I soon began to believe <laughs> that they were coming alive. So uh, sleep deprivation is a very interesting uh, phenomenon if you have been a new parent uh, now or in the future or have experienced that. And so one day, um, I decided, my daughter here is about three years old. We were out in the backyard. This is not, this is a shot that I set up at my best friend's house. But my daughter and I were out in the backyard. She's about three or four here, I think. And we were out in the backyard one day, and she was painting on her easel. And then she reached over and she painted on a rock. And then she went and she painted on the building. And then she went and she painted some plants. And it dawned on me that the childhood curiosity of wanting to adorn things with color, to make them your own, or in this particular image that I did set up for the view camera, the idea that she wanted to paint the dead sunflowers yellow and to kind of per perpetuate them very much like the last dancing flower that you saw. This idea of wanting to prolong things, to be curious about things, to anoint them, um, to covet them. It was a very interesting concept to me and made me very curious about the sort of... Um, what, what our cells and our body have, which is a timetable. And pregnancy is automatic pilot. Uh, cells divide. Uh, babies, children are created. Um, many of us are very fortunate that everything is on automatic pilot and it works correctly as designed. And so this whole idea of trying to intercede interests me. And it was a childlike thing that made me create this photograph. And so I got back in the studio then at night. <laughs> Sound like this mad woman in the basement. But anyway, um, I thought, what if the sunflower really was trying very hard to continue to perpetuate itself? And this series is called Acts of Futility. Um, they also mirror things in my life that were going on at work and different places um, in society. And this is about 94 to 96. This sunflower is in a vase, and there's a... a light up there that's hopefully supposed to rejuvenate it. And it's actually trying to pull itself up by the threads. It's trying to follow the light, just like the first plant followed the window light. And then this other uh, idea of um, humanity helping with uh, nature, uh, the hand of man holding a, a stick that was given to me by a sculpture teacher that had a hummingbird's nest on it, but the idea that the nest is vertical and that you could never um, lay your eggs in there or that the, bir the bird could never come in and feed the, the young um, chicks that she would be nurturing. Um, all of these little um, acts of futility I began to photograph late at night. Um, a pomegranate dripping into a, a vase that has a crack that's leaking. Um, 
guess I'm just a mad housewife, huh? <laughs> I, maybe I didn't do well with childbirth. I don't know. But anyway, um, then these, uh, I know that I had a lot of fun at night uh, all by myself. These are little chickens that came in a box, and I thought, well, you know, uh, incubation, the idea that they're escaping, that man's hand might uh, guide one into the jaws of danger, which are really, these are actually casts of teeth that I asked the dentist if I could have. Um, I'm always thinking props. I'm always shopping. This is a possum that died in our shed, and this is my dog's play toy on its face. And this whole idea of the scientist, the mad scientist behind the curtain, um, revealing the illusion of um, uh, the figure and the fact that it is possibly dead and decayed, but it's wearing this mask, and also about Frankenstein and rejuvenation. All of these things really interest me about the technology that, that um, prevails with medicine and with uh, biology. And so anyway, um, I finished this in about 1995. And then I was in the library, and um, I was looking over at the deaccession books, and there were about 25 books all on biology and cellular manifestation and how cells uh, divide. And so they're a quarter each, and I bought about 25 books from the old biology department. And I carted them home, and I began putting transfers on them. Things, uh, plants that I'd been photographing, I made Polaroid transfers actually on the library page. And the sensation when you do this is when you wet the library book, the page itself in the water to make the transfer, you get all of the smells of the library. It is the most fascinating sensual experience. And I call this my science projects because they're, they're derived from um, clinical technical books about cellular growth and decay and rejuvenation. And then all of these objects that are sitting on the shelves were found in the yard. This one is about seeds. And there's a, a wonderful book that all women should read. It's called Woman, a Geographical, I think Geographical topo Topographical Study by Natalie Angier. And it talks about, uh, for, for instance, she says, the ovary is no beauty. And it talks about how magical women's bodies are and how fine-tuned we are and how things that we're able to do as females are just miraculous. And, why, and I think it's why we had the goddess culture for so long. We, the men thought we were pretty mysterious. And so you should read that book. Um, I plan to have my daughter read it as, when she gets a little bit older because it's both clinical and philosophical, and also it, it covets the fact that um, all human beings are special, but it certainly makes women and the biology of birth very um, personal. These things my husband finds in the yard, you'd think they were the cats bringing them up to the step, but actually this is a hummingbird that got stuck on the tangerine tree. And um, the images um, are of course, very muted and hard to see unless you're up real close. But again, there are objects from the garden that have fallen off or decayed, and then I've layered them and sewn them and manipulated them. Now, the images that you see in the exhibition uh, here today have gone through a, a very interesting evolution in that they were abandoned uh, body cast from our sculpture instructor, Jim Wolsterman's class. And they were um, actually created to be a wall uh, panel motif. And I would go by them several times, going back to ceramics or cutting through the back of our um, lab at Grossmont. And I would eye them because they were just sitting there collecting gum wrappers and debris. And, and they were abandoned. And I, I actually felt for them. I felt kind of sorry for them, these women who had just kind of been left there on this table. So I got up my nerve. And I said, are you going to do anything with those? And he said, no, the class that made them has gone on to other things. And I said, well, can I have them? And he said, yes. And then I backed my car up because I knew that these uh, forms of the women were very, very interesting to me. They reminded me of my early fabric pieces that I had made in Los Angeles. 
and they sort of represented a, a, a tableau or something by which I might possibly be able to um, make images and artwork about. Now, I brought them home, and I carried them into the house, and I immediately tried to light them. You know, I immediately tried to put all this control into them, and I could not make one image happen. I was very disappointed in it. I told my husband, they, they look so great, abandoned, but when I bring them in and I try to style them and I try to work with them and I try to light them like I did with my work in the 80s, well, it just doesn't work. And so my husband said, well, listen, just put them outside, you know, Emma, we need you, and, you know, I hear that a lot, we need you, and Mom, I need you. And so I put them outdoors, and um, I went about making the images that you've just seen, the science experiments on the little shelves like you would see in a laboratory and the earlier pieces. And then, as I was out collecting items for the last project, I looked over, and I had never in my life seen such beautiful sculptures out in nature. Mother Nature had done a better job of styling them than I ever could. They lie um, flat out in the backyard under different trees and around different places, and the trees, the camphor tree, the fig trees, different things just float off and fall into them. And I have absolutely nothing to do with them. I will, in a little bit, insert my hand as the hands you've seen in these images. But basically, I made a first series of a, a dozen of them in which I showed them at Miracosta. And um, uh, the, this is one of the images. And this is the beginning of Under the Skin of Grace. It was shot with a 4x5 view camera. And so here I am. I have a quarter acre property in La Mesa. And I'm loading the camera and the tripod just like a documentary photographer. And then I'm walking 20 paces out in the backyard. So you know, I really felt like now I was a taker instead of a maker, which is when you construct images for the camera. Now I was out finding them, and I felt like my colleague David Wing, who goes to Death Valley and all over. I was trekking out to the wilderness and finding these uh, women in the in the woods or the garden or wherever. I could not let go of some of the elements, uh, very much like the science projects. I couldn't let go of this idea of object and illusion of tangible and referential. And so I made these plastic boxes, and these Im images are recessed back about three or four inches. And then on the shelves, just like the science projects, I put objects. And I also dipped into a little bit of my own autobiography. The writing there on, is a copy of a notebook that I uh, acquired from my grandfather. It lists which dairy he needs to go to, and which client he needs to call on, and which uh, executive secretary's name, you know, his little cheat book, and I, I put that in there. I also called my mom up and had her mail me little things. I had her bridge group send me little objects to put in. Um, I kind of made it a collaborative um, effort on my part. And um, so there's a pomegranate with a little locket uh, right up here, and there's a woven leaf that I bought at a, at a jewelry store. So I started putting... Um, you know, the man-made, handmade things, things of memory, I started putting those in with the um, tableaus of the bodies. These are all green bean plants that have dried with little springs from clocks hanging off of them and a perfume bottle with uh, people inside looking at the stars. Now, don't ask me where this came from, you know. I don't know. This is as um, intuitive as working down in the basement late at night. I would just bring all my stuff, and I would pin these images up on the wall, and then I would respond to them with the objects. I have a quote here um, that I thought kind of described what I was trying to do by, um, memory is the cabinet of the imagination, the treasury of reason, the registry of conscience, and the council chamber of thought. And so I just saw these, uh, these bodies out in the earth as also being a tableau for myself. But I, now I, I do forward. There we go. These two little dolls down here are pin cushions from my grandmother. And um, their uh, stuffing is showing, and their heads are, are porcelain, and they're sort of 
well, they're decaying, but they're really quite beautiful, and she would often talk about them. So I personalized them as much as I'm willing to share with you. I made them mine. Threads, um, little boats adrift with uh, mince shirt buttons in them, leaves, chaotic rolls of thread. So I tried very hard to bring the outside inside and to bring the photographs with the objects in these. Um, I, I can't think of another word for them because they're really not altars to me. They're um, like sculptural pieces with the continuing decay and the evolution of nature. Then um, my, my daughter proceeds to continue to grow and um, we get into after-school activities. We get into homework. I have a full-time job. Uh, my husband has graduated from graduate school. My life is very full, and this view camera is very slow and cumbersome. So about two and a half years ago, I said to my husband, I think I have to make that big decision. Of course, when I say things like that, he says, like, what is this? Are we going to buy something? Are we going to move? I said, I think I'm going to have to go digital, OK? So, and for a photographer, that's a big step. Um, but the immediacy of the digital camera allowed me to continue to document these uh, sculptural pieces out in the yard, to see the, the changes in a more timely fashion. And also, it allowed me to examine them more critically and more clearly, and to understand change in a more immediate way. So I... I um, uh, my husband refers to my, my digital stuff as my toys. So I went and I purchased the a digital camera, upgraded my computer, and got an archival printer. And I began photographing them on a, oh, a, 10 times uh, more immediately. And uh, every weekend, I could go out and work for a half an hour instead of two and a half, three hours. And I'd lose the light. And this was just such an immediate way. And so what I did, this is the first image, and I, I don't know if we, I don't know if I have focus on here, if this is even sharp. These are amazing slides, I have to tell you, in that, um, I hate to do this, this is just like MOPA, isn't it, everybody who goes to MOPA lectures? Is that sharp? Yeah, that's sharp enough. Um, <laughs> they're always focusing the slides at MOPA lectures. It's sort of an in-joke if, if you've gone to the museum. And I say that endearingly. Basically, this is the turning point image. And a gentleman tonight asked me all kinds of questions about this, as though this, like, you know, he, he knew. Like, he had read my mind. This is the first image I made with a digital camera. Uh, it was in uh, February, March, the rainy season. I came in. I brought it up on the screen. I started working on it. Um, and then I began to examine it, and then the opening between the arm and the side of the waist looked so empty. It needed something. Um, like one carries their young child there on their hip, it needed to nurture or care for something. And so um, I have a collection of um, animals in my freezer, and so I went and found a dove and scanned it on the scanner, and I placed it inside there. And then I was full circle for where I needed to be. I was able to photograph these immediately. Mother Nature was doing all of the design work. And then I could sit and study it in my basement again at night when everyone's asleep. And then I could, through layers and Photoshop, make the figures, um, well, make them tra transcend and describe more of what I thought about the work in general. So I've put them in a different order than the exhibition in that I now have each body part for you to see the transformation that they go through in a, a decade or easily in the last um, six to ten years. Um, this is from, I don't know, if the, I think it's called lichen. I don't know. Is that what it's called? It's kind of like a green algae that grows from water and standing water. And I guess it's very rich in nutrients because other things begin to parasite and grow on it. Some of the images are manipulated. Uh, some are from past images. I scanned them in. This is an earlier Under the Skin of Grace 
image, except the leaves that are falling up here at the top I added later. And I begin to use drop shadow and different things to add a more three-dimensional quality to the work. This, uh, these images that look like I went to Africa and found them in the Sahara are due to the dog who digs and the dust gets spread all over the yard. And so we have a whole series attributed to Buddy, the golden retriever, um, because he, um, he put a fine layer of dust on all of the ladies in the backyard. The etching you see here is from a Durer print. So I began to look at etchings. I began to look at... Um, um, I had been going with my parents a lot to Scripps, looking at x-rays and different things as they were going through some medical uh, procedures. And so I also looked at skeletons and old etchings from Dante's Inferno. Uh, whatever, whatever rose to the top, that's what I would look at. This is an earlier image of one of the pieces, and you can see how beautifully pristine it is. It hasn't gotten the patina of the backyard yet. There's a little girl rising up over on the right um, out of the water. Um, I captured her with a little uh, point-and-shoot throwaway Fuji camera one day at the swimming pool and scanned her in. And as the piece evolves, um, it begins to age and grow and change. And I also got very fascinated with, in, in Photoshop, you can copy the, the whole skin with the magic wand or whatever selection tool you want to use. And then I would take it through a series of filters. And I got really, again, kind of into biology. I thought, I can make skin, you know? I can make, I can make uh, patinas. I can make mold. I can make all these things. I can truly enrich these images if I want to. And so that's what I began to do. Um, I'm in a process now where um, so many of the body parts are full to the top that you can't even see a figure underneath. Um, so it would almost be like finding them buried and digging them up out of the ground. And so now what I do on uh, shooting sessions is I, I bring them up to the side of the house and I photograph them and then I pull some leaves out and I photograph them again because the digital tool is so immediate. I mean, it's just a flash card. I can just keep shooting and shooting and shooting and I can have all these versions. So I pulled, I, I call it my deconstruction series. So I take a little bit out, I take a little bit out and I work my way down to the bottom, to the, to the figure, to the thing itself. And so this is a, actually two layers kind of put together and brought over. Um, so it kind of looks like it's under a crust doesn't it? Or a, a layer of crusted over. And it's really just one layer from one level and a layer from another level um, sandwiched together with the computer. This was an original image in the, in the backyard shot with the 4 by 5 and scanned in. These slides are really interesting and they're actually made from the digital files and burned to slide film. Isn't that amazing? So these have gone through this hybrid process of being film and then being scanned and then being manipulated and then being um, re res the resolution has been made correct to have it burned to film. I, I, the digital tool is just so exciting to me. I mean, it's like my color copier days, you know, and it's all in, all in my house. I don't have to go pay anybody. I don't know if you can see, but there's a little bit of skeletal arm sort of being revealed and a little bit of a... a uh, shoulder bone up there. Some I manipulate, some I don't. Um, some I add things to. We started thinking of them like a compost pile. We throw things out in them, see where they'd land. I mean, you know, if the dog can do some art, so can we as human beings. And then I got really uh, excited about layers. And so, for example, again, this idea of being the mad scientist and making skin I scanned a book out of, uh, again, out of a book, one of my biology books, a whole red, luscious 11 by 14 image of nerves, you know, the human nerves and how they work and connect, you know. And then I just put that layer of red, blue nerves underneath the skin. I don't know if you can see that or not. But this idea that the, the body gives off heat and that the body is changing and that cells have a timeline and a manifestation 
They grow, evolve, and change, just like these pieces are growing and evolving and changing. And here's one of the deconstructed images all the way down to the, uh, the dust from all the leaves decaying. And then there's a little garden snake in there from a etching from a Dante's Inferno book. This book my grandmother had, and she caught us when we were little looking at it because there's some nude people in it, you know, and oh, mercy goodness. And so when she passed away, I requested this book. <laughs> and so, again, it's sort of my archaeology from my past as a child and the naughty pictures that I would sneak away and look at in, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Again, Buddy at Work. Um, it, it looked to me, these, this looks very tribal, and so I found a draw. Uh, my husband has How to Draw the Figure. He's a figurative painter, and he has all these books that he uses to teach from. And so um, I found this dynamic drawing where they made swirls to create the breast and the arms and the torso. So there's a little bit of a tattooing or a slight little green effect on the figure. And also the breaking away of the box uh, that they're in. That, that interests me, breaking away from the page, breaking away from the container. And so when my mom began to ship us all of our um, trunk loads of high school memorabilia, you, yeah, maybe your mom or your parents have given you that. My dad said, come clean this stuff out or we're going to throw it out. So we drove out to where they lived. I, in seventh grade, had made this, I'd grown beans, and I'd made this little drawing for science. Now, I'm probably never going to do anything with this, but I think if you want to understand how an artist ticks, you have to know what they, they do do and what they discard and what they, you know, what they edit in and what they edit out. And so I just thought this was so interesting. I love growing those beans and checking them every day, and then I figured out, well, that's where this science thing of mine, you know, this idea of change and metamorphosis. So I dropped it in the bottom of a piece and floated it in a, a white piece of paper. I have no idea what's going to happen other than it's made me start thinking of the book page and maybe a book for these images at some point. Um, this is a new image that I made this summer. Um, this is a, and I, and I know it's a little dark, um, but the hands there are, that are grabbing the figure that are very hard to see are the hands of my father. And my father and I have identical hands, and so I took a picture of us holding hands, and then I just put it in there, him holding the figure. And so here they are. Um, some things are added, some things are found. I'm not here to sell you on Adobe Photoshop or digital tools, but um, what seems to be an invasion of water in this dust, dusty desert of a figure, um, actually I grabbed the dust over the figure, made it a separate layer. There's a filter called Liquify. And so I just sat there, you know, with my mouse late at night and worked it until I made it look like water flowing into dust. Again, um, I would see a lot of x-rays, I would look at a lot of MRIs, and so I began to put skeletons and little references to what, were, what was under the skin of my graces here. And also began to think about touch and, the, and your hand and um, memory and, and loss and remembrance and decay. And I actually do believe, um, I know that these really dance on a lot of very personal issues for me, but I think they're also very beautiful. They're beautiful when I find them and I think the digital camera tends to create a sort of interpretation that keeps it in that realm bird dropping a leaf on a broken egg out of the nest. And again, this one's not in the exhibition. Every once in a while, I just have to break out of that frame, you know? We photographers are confined by that frame.
The same gentleman that saw that the bird was added between the arm and the um, waist of the first image also knew that the frog was um, added. So I guess I'm not that good at Photoshop. <laughs> but yes, the frog was added, and the, and the water was made to look turbulent. This is, my, this is my most aggressive skin, I want you to know, because I actually in, kind of enjoy giving it a little boo-boo over there on the back, you know, and making it really tactile. This is the same piece, but um, the digital camera has white balance, it has fluorescent, it has shady, it has sunny, it probably has, you know, southwest... Um, Southern California dials, I don't know, for the light. But so if you put it on a different light balance or a different light level or you white balance to something different, you can really force the color. So I really embrace the tool. I really try to examine it in, in such a way that um, it works for me. There's some struggling uh, Dante Inferno people in there, but you have to look really hard. So I guess you'll have to go back to the show, huh? which I think is the whole idea. These are seed pods from the trees down at the bottom of the, um, my property. And then floating underneath are tiny little human embryos, but I made them green, sort of like I'm growing a whole little set of cloned um, humans underneath the water in, in this giant mother image, if you wish. This one looks to me like bodies that might have been found in Pompeii. I don't know if you've ever read about how they found the bodies and the ash went over and made these crust, crusted casts and then of course their bodies decayed inside. Then they infuse the bodies and then they're able to see the human forms uh, when they unearth uh, the land around the destruction of Pompeii. This, this kind of burnt ash feeling. And this is done by photographing the piece in bright sun and then also in shade and making exposure for the highlight and exposure for the shadow and then joining the two exposures together to kind of get that high key look. I hope it's okay to tell you about the photography. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I always do this. I demystify everything. You know, I have some quotes here from Ralph Waldo Emerson and all this, and I could have done the really, you know. But I figure maybe all of you would like to know why and how and what for, as you know. Because there's certainly many, many um, people who have explored these ideas. My father's hidden in this one. You saw this one from before. So I did scan some of the 4x5s in. Um, I made them the same resolution as the digital camera. So to some degree, I feel that the merging of the earlier work with the, the more immediate work has been fairly seamless. Certainly the printer puts it on an even printing field, I guess. We should say playing field, but printing field. The bodies in... in uh, after they've been out in the sun for a while, go this beautiful white porcelain. And then when winter starts to come, they begin to grow things and little parasites and all kinds of things happen. So they go from this sort of pristine alabaster por porcelain to this sort of icky, as my daughter would say, I'm not going to touch that gooey to the dry dust of uh, the dog. And um, I enjoy that duality and that change. Now, what I'd like to do with this work, because of the, the statement on the wall, The Seven Daughters of Eve is a book by Brian Sykes, and in it, and, and Cheryl alluded to it earlier, um, when you do gene, let's see, let's back up a little bit. When you do genealogy, you research by surnames. You research by the, the father's name. And so my mother, who had done extensive genealogy, would go through all of the, the houses, the wells, the strongs, and so forth. But if you do research on your family through DNA, there is a, a strand on your DNA um, 
you know, helix or whatever that is, there's a little bit that can be measured, and it's called the mitochondrial DNA. And it's passed from mother to daughter. It, it can also be ascertained from mother to son, but that's a different type of testing. And this is about where I stop with the science project because I am not a scientist. But I did read the whole book by Brian Sykes. I said, this is really confusing, this is really hard, but I kept reading it. But basically, from mother to daughter, you can pass this DNA marker. Brian Sykes, who um, is a professor of genetics uh, at Oxford in England, has gone and taken DNA samples from from bodies that have been frozen in the ice and then discovered and run the <laughs> mitochondrial DNA and then traveled to the village nearby and run the same mitochondrial DNA and found that the ancestor found up in the ice belongs to the people down in the village, which then creates quite a stir because then they're worried that their ancestor is not going to be properly buried or who is this and they get a real connection when they realize through DNA that this is someone that preceded them like this could be my mother you know that thing and I found that so fascinating that uh, uh, Professor Sykes can with a swab of your DNA s s research back and find out which one of the seven tribes we all bubbled up from and he has been doing extensive research, and of course the original mitochondrial Eve uh, has been ascertained to have evolved out of Africa. But there are tribes due to mountain ranges in the Pyrenees, there are specific tribes in northern Europe and in the Mediterranean. And this is just fascinating to me that you could now, through the science of, you know, CSI, the movie, you know, the TV show, you know, through forensics, you could find out, gee, you know, I really am German, or I really am Irish, or I really am from Turkey, you know. And part of the fascination is my first name. My first name, Suda, was my great-grandmother's name. And we think it's the, the name of the Armenian uh, midwife that delivered her from my great-great-grandmother. And uh, the story is that the, uh, my great-great-grandfather said, if this baby lives, I'll name it after you. And so we believe that Suda came from an Armenian name. But we're not Armenian. We're 50, Heinz 57 from southern Illinois. But um, so people ask me, you know, where does Suda come from? And an interesting corollary to my name is that there is a book out there, a lexicon, very much like the histories of, uh, what is it, Herodotus, Herodotus? Uh, that's the, you remember the movie The English Patient where the guy is carrying a history of the ancient world? Well, there's another book called The Suda. It's a lexicon, and there's a copy over at UCSD. And so all of this really fascinates me that my name, first of all, I might have bubbled up in the Mediterranean. Number two, that there's this book named after me that talks about the ancient world, and that possibly even though these women exist only in my mind and in my backyard, that there could be other bodies just like them buried all over the world. I really do believe that. And so I, and I need to go on a, an adventure. I need to go on an exploration. But unfortunately, I cannot leave La Mesa. So <laughs> through, through the digital tools, I've decided to create a journey. So this is a temple that once existed where one of the body parts that you have seen, one of the women from under the skin of grace, under the skin of the earth, was buried. And this is a temple, an old etching that I found, that I then followed a map until I actually discovered her. And we'll see if I can trick the rest of you. Um, now, this is the Cabazon Shopping Center off of the 10 on the way to Palm Springs. But it's really another one of those temples where one of the mitochondrial DNA ladies exists that I found over in the brush, over there on the right. So what I'm getting to is I'm getting about archetypes and how that I hope these women evolve into being um, uh, actually discovered by a journey that Suda took from reading the book, The Suda, and finding the clues, right? This is actually along the 15 at Temecula. It's to stop erosion from the earth. But doesn't it look like a burial mound or a pyramid? Yes. Yes. And I thought it looked just like, I've got to work on my wet plate, uh, my fake wet plate. They start to look kind of 
more like tarnished photographs. This is another burial mound. This is uh, off a of Warren Road in Hemet, where they have a lot of dairy cows, okay? But, but I saw it, and I thought it looked perfect. Doesn't it look just like those dust-covered images that Buddy made for me? Hmm? Yeah, I think so, yeah. It's got the stains on it and everything. And this is the uh, Riverside <laughs> uh, Fairgrounds. I don't know if you've ever been there. But um, its working title is the Taj Mahal. But again, this is where... I'm sure I'll unearth another one of these um, markers of uh, femininity and early womanhood. And finally, um, in a strange way, this is a tribute to my father. This is uh, the tee-off marker at a golf course. <laughs> but doesn't it look like a Stonehenge or, you know, a Venus of Willendorf from the back? I mean, in other words, this idea of possibly following the, the, the literature of the Suda and finding something buried at the base of this. And actually, it's in southern Illinois near Wren Lake, if, if uh, Ron knows where that is. Uh, it was a tribute to my dad, the golfer. So now I'm just going to show you these last four pieces. This is the, the first image that I um, made, I discovered, that, that nature made for me, and I... I Photographed, and this is the piece that's the signature piece for the show that that we selected. And then this is the first digital image I made of the piece. Um, again, harboring or mothering that that bird down at the bottom. And this is the image in the show. And then this last one is is actually uh, in honor of my parents. Um, I made this this summer, and the, the very light gray sort of leaves that you see on top are um, silver maple leaf seeds. Uh, my mom, at, when she was five, planted a silver maple leaf tree that grew, grew to almost 100 feet. And we went back in April and picked up the seeds, and I've been trying to grow a, a tree in tribute to my mom. And I really want you to see that this is a continuum, that everything... It bubbles up, it erupts, it's born, it moves forward. Life is a journey, everything's an adventure, and everything that ends starts again. So I do really want to leave you with the beauty of that thought. And I did have um, many, many uh, very academic quotes with, as we say at home, $10 words in them. Uh, but I'll read you the last one, which I think... Um, is, I think, the most important one in, in living and also in making artwork. And, and that is that um, you have absolutely no time. Your life races by really quickly. Yet, on the other hand, you have lots of time. And that, to me, is the duality and the struggle. And Ralph Waldo Emerson says it best. He says, adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. So... I've been very patient watching uh, these images evolve. And you've all been very patient listening to me <laughs> weave my story about them. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. And again, thank you for the opportunity for presenting my work.